Do we understand that when we're talking about holiness, we're talking about something that God has been prior to creation? Yeah? Therefore, holiness has got nothing fundamentally to do with sin. Do you understand? Because God was holy prior to creation. Holy, holy, holy. The word means otherness or uniqueness or one of a kindness. It's where we get our word whole from. The integration of parts, in a sense. It's also the word that we understand as perfect, which doesn't mean moral perfection. It means integrated wholeness. Holiness is a relational term. So when we're celebrating holiness, we're celebrating the wholeness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we've been introduced to in Genesis chapter 1 as Elohim, the a plural God who says, let us make human being in our image, our, us. And when the male and the female break relationship and are hiding, it says they heard the sound of the Lord God in the cool of the day. That's what it says in our English. In the Hebrew it says, and they heard the sound of Elohim Yahweh in Ruach. Ruach, you're introduced to in verse 2 of Genesis 1 as the Holy Spirit that hovers over the deep. Elohim Yahweh. walking relationally in Ruach. Right from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? We're introduced to Elohim in chapter 1. The name for God in chapter 2 is Yahweh or the unspeakable name, and the central sound is the sound of a breath, which is the spirit. Spirit, breath, ruach. Ruach is feminine. Did you know that the word mercy, which dominates the Hebrew scriptures, comes from the same root as the word womb? God is neither male nor female. All of maternity, all of paternity emerges as expressions of the very nature and character of God. We cannot be, in reality, anything other than God is. Therefore, our maternity and paternity are expressions of the very nature of God. God as Father doesn't mean God is male. Ruach as Spirit, as feminine, doesn't mean God is female. But everything that it means to be male and everything that it means to be female derive their character and nature from God who creates them. Make sense? Okay. When I speak in places, I, I never think that somebody is coming to take me out. Not for coffee, I mean. <laughs> and I, uh, the Holy Spirit is very kind, both to me and to them. <laughs> I tell people now, I have friends in special forces who aren't healed yet. <laughs> 
Hey, that's a joke. <laughs> I've been set up a few times and I didn't know it until afterwards because something happened. One time I was up in Orangeville, Ontario, and, um, and I didn't know that it was a setup, that I was going to get ambushed theologically, right? And so I come in and I have Friday night and all day Saturday with this community. And Friday night I get to speak first and then there's going to be a panel discussion and it's going to be moderated by a seminary professor. And um, you know, I tend to be sort of like a child about a lot of things. I think everybody loves each other and God loves them and they know that. And I mean, it's just, you know, children, that's what they think until they, they learn that trust is dangerous. And, um, and so I tend to think, oh, this is, this is awesome, right? And I don't know that this seminary professor is, he is after me. Well, when I come to speak, like tonight, I don't plan out what I'm going to do, and I don't think, I didn't know I was going to tell you this story. Right? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you understand? I like this. I like not knowing. I like the fact that I can't create an agenda out of stuff. Thanks. And um, so I come into this situation, and I've got the first session. Well, this is Friday night, and I get up, and for whatever reason, I go deeply into some of my story that I told you the other night, day, whatever it was, the highly emotional thing, you know? <laughs> and I go deeply into that, and I don't know why. Why did I go there? Don't know, right? But I did. We take a 15-minute break. We come to sit down in the panel, and this theologian seminary professor leans over to me and he says this. It's okay. He says, I came here tonight to come after you and I have nothing left. <laughs> it's one thing to have your theological categories. It's another thing when the incarnation happens right in front of your face and you have to deal with a real human being. Right? It changes all the conversation. And I didn't know what he meant. You're coming after me and you have nothing left? That, what does that mean? Right? And so it was one of those moments of time when all I could feel for this man was this immeasurable tenderness. So he does kind of come after me a little bit because he starts... He st his, one of his accusations was that in the shack Mackenzie dealt with his stuff too fast. That it doesn't happen that fast. And I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, you know he's right. He's right. And I said, you know, part of it is I'm trying to squeeze an 11-year process into a weekend because I didn't want to write an 11-year book for my kids. <laughs> right? And I said, you know, as, I, as I'm listening to you, the book would have probably been better. And I said, you know, if we ever do a movie, I want the fury side of his lostness to be more evident. And I think you're right. We go through the evening, and afterwards, he has a few grown children who were sitting there that I didn't know were there. And they came up to me afterwards, and they're bawling. And his daughter hugs me and says, You had no idea, but we lost our mother less than a year ago, and my father is lost inside his grief. And he was coming after you tonight to take it out on you. Everything that he's mad to God about. The next morning, I get up to speak, and from the audience, he, came, he comes up onto the stage and hugs me. And his kids are sitting there with their mouths wide open. And they told me later, we have never seen that in our lives. I didn't know. 
And this is one of the things when I speak, I don't know who's there. The Holy Spirit knows who's there. And there's an incredible tenderness about the way God climbs inside our spaces. I was at this, um, this uh, thing down in Arkansas, and um, I was speaking to a group about the size. And when I'm talking to people afterwards and I'm signing books and stuff, this big guy, big guy, comes by and I'm, I'm talking, but I can sense his presence. And he stands there with his kind of sideways to me. And I just say, excuse me. And I reach over and I hug him and he slips a piece of paper into my hand. And he can't even look at me. Right? Big guy. Well, it doesn't take much for me to be with a big guy. I mean, it's just like... So he leaves and I'm back in my conversation. And the next day, I take out the piece of paper to see what he... And it's got two typewritten pages on this side, and it's got a handwritten note on the back. This is a few months ago. And um, so I look at the typewritten pages, and these two pages, and I've seen them before, are an absolute slam against me and the shack. I mean, they are just coming after me, right? And if you want to read them later, you're welcome. Right? But it's one of these things when you read it, you think they didn't read the book, right? Which is often the case. And um, uh, because the stuff in here doesn't make any sense. I didn't write that. It's not in the book. No, no, but that's okay. So it's two pages of that. On the back, here's his note to me. Paul, I came tonight for the purpose of warning God's people of the dangers mentioned in this article, only to be extremely blessed by hearing your heart and seeing God using you to change the status quo Christianity to know God in a real way. I still have a problem with, you know, the Papa figure and all that kind of stuff, and he goes on to talk a little bit about that. I grew up, too, in a family always feeling like I was going to be kicked out of my home by my earthly father. The hurt and pain was so severe, I've wept so deeply that those presents, present felt I possibly belonged in an insane institute. I'm sorry for being so eager to come against the shack. I'd love to get more information in deeper healing about the Father's love for me so I can receive John 17, 26's love in my life. Can you have someone contact me? I've been in ministry 42 years and still don't know how to receive the Father's love. And he puts his name and his phone number. And the guy that had brought me into this place, I gave that contact information and I've heard he's just doing great. But he had come to take me out, right? And had an encounter. I love that. Sometimes people responses to where you're at is very painful. And God comes, puts his arm around you as he has done to me, and he says, you know, they can't do anything unless I allow it. And if I allow it, I am in the process of creating good purpose out of that. Is that okay with you? And I've been in a couple of those conversations. And there is a real sense that if I said no, he would have intervened. There was a sense in that relationship. He is saying, is that okay with you? Do you know that this is a God who by nature submits? When Jesus, in a room full of human agendas, in John, upper room, part of John, right? And he goes and finds the basin and the 
and fills it with water and begins to wash these men's feet. He's doing it because their feet are dirty and they need to be washed. He doesn't do it to give them a model of what it means to be a servant. He does this is because it's his nature. This is what he does. And when you see Jesus, you see the Father. The problem is, and we have this one chair thing over here, it's not that simple. Because even when we have the one chair, we acknowledge that the, there are good attributes of God to that one chair, as well as the distance, and the difficulty, and the anger, and the disappointment, and all those things. Because we're all trying to consolidate it into the one chair. So our conversation about holiness is very different than if it's inside the uniqueness of this other-centered, self-giving love. This is a God who by nature submits. If you, if you don't understand that, then you don't know God very well. How many times has He stepped into your life in the midst of your stupid choices, mine, and said, you are so bad at this, I'm making your choices from now on. Now, wouldn't we like Him to do that? Right? Like, I am really bad at this. This authenticity stuff and truth-telling stuff. Would you just come in and do it for me? He doesn't do that. He climbs into our participation, submits to it, and then builds stuff out of it. It's part of the miracle of who this God is. And we're caught in this tension. I want to read you a quote. It's actually in the 13th chapter of Crossroads, and it start, you know how I, I like to start chapters with these little quotations, you know, quotes. Listen to this. The Apostle tells us that God is love, and therefore, seeing He is an infinite being, it follows that He is an infinite fountain of love. Seeing He is an all-sufficient being, it follows that He is a full and overflowing and inexhaustible fountain of love. And in that he is an unchangeable and eternal being, he is an unchangeable and eternal fountain of love. You know who wrote that? Jonathan Edwards. One of the most beautiful descriptions of God as love you will ever read. But Jonathan Edwards was caught between the indivisible unity, and between this relationship. On that day, he was seeing this. In this chapter, Tony, the main character, has a massive confrontation with the lies that exist in his own heart. And there is a scene in which he is facing the accuser of his soul. And it comes in different layers. And in this one, he is facing an enemy called ego. Tony didn't know exactly why, but he felt Ego's logic was sick and twisted. Ego saw his hesitation and quickly continued. Now, hear me. This is the enemy of Tony speaking to him. This is the lie speaking to him in his soul. You, you understand? Listen to what he says. Look to Jesus, Mr. Spencer. Your freedom cost him everything. He gave his very life to set you free. This man went to God and cried. Again, ego became theatrical, turning skyward with eyes closed, as if in the deepest pleading and intercession toward heaven. Quote, Dear God, pour out all your wrath, all the anger you feel toward this vile and wicked creation for the myriads of disgusting activities of wretched humanity Pour out your just and holy fury, the bow of your wrath bent and the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bending the arrow at their hearts. Pour your righteous wrath instead on me. Let me bear your cruelty, the just asserts of their wickedness. Burn me with your eternal fire instead of them, that your sword of divine justice that is brandished even now over their heads would fall instead on me. And with that, Ego bowed his head as if the mighty edge would cleave his being in two. Those 
words are quotes from Jonathan Edwards. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And I've got these two paradigms of the character of God juxtaposed within Jonathan Edwards himself. Tony's response is very interesting. So then tell me, began Tony, his voice stronger but his tone soft. Did it work? Did it work? Ego snapped back to attention. He had not anticipated such a question. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, did it work? Did Jesus bear the wrath of God successfully? Did it work? Of course, it worked. This is Jesus we're talking about. Ego didn't sound completely sure. Tony pressed the point. So, God poured out all his wrath and anger on Jesus instead of human beings, and his wrath and fury were forever satisfied? Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. Uh, well, not exactly. Um, great question, though, Mr. Spencer. A excellent question. You should be proud of yourself for thinking of such an ingenious question. He was stalling, and Tony knew it. Well, Ego fidgeted, alternately putting weight on one foot and then the other. Here is how you have to look at it, Mr. Spencer. And I wouldn't be explaining this to just anyone. It's rather hush-hush, you know, belonging to the category of assumptions better left unspoken. But it can be our little secret. You see, the truth is that God is rather difficult to get along with. His creation, he raised his palm indicating Tony, has disobeyed him grievously. As a result, the wrath of God is now a constant part of God's being, like an ever-burning fire, a necessary evil, if you would. And it continues to burn with an eternal flame consuming everyone and everything that does not accept and appropriate what Jesus did. Are you following? He raised one eyebrow which stood out starkly on his pasty face, looking to Tony for agreement. Well, regardless, you must always remember that the one constant about God is his righteous, and his, uh, righteous wrath and anger, which he has already poured out on Jesus. So if you want to escape the wrath of God, you have to become like Jesus. Surrender your life and live like Jesus did, holy and pure. Be ye perfect, even as you're, you know, as I am perfect. That's in the Bible. So then, Tony said as he looked at the dry and desolate ground at his feet, then there's no hope for someone like me. That's what you're saying. I don't have what it takes to live like that, like Jesus, holy and pure. No, no, that's not true, Mr. Spencer. There's always hope, especially for someone who tries as hard as you, who is as special as you. There's just no certainty, that's all. Then you're telling me that relationship with God is just wishful thinking, nothing to really stand on, just a possibility? Oh, please don't discount wishful thinking. Almost everything in your world is manufactured, manufactured by wishful thinking. Don't sell yourself short. In your wishful thinking, you're hoping you become very much like God. For God so loved the world, challenged Tony. It was part of a verse that Tony remembered from somewhere. Ego dropped his gaze dramatically to the ground. That is so incredibly sad, isn't it? Sad? Tony refuted, it isn't sad. If it's true, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. God loves the world. That means God loves those of us in the world. God loves me. The realization ignited his anger, which flashed bright, and he embraced it, spewing it on ego. You know what? I don't care what you want. You are liars. And your lies, and it goes from there. We're caught. Sometimes, even in our three chairs, one chair is elevated above the other chairs. It's just what we do, right? We don't see this as a circle of relationship. I know we're tired tonight. I know it's been a long day. I'm going to just walk you through a little sequence, and then we'll be done for tonight. And this little sequence 
has to do with how, do you, how does one live like this inside the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How do you do that? And one of the best ways to see it is to oversee it. That is to see it when you watch Jesus live this way. Jesus lived by faith in the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we agree on that? He didn't have the little deity card up his sleeve so that when he ran into a situation, he could pull the card out and play the second person of the Trinity card and do a magic trick. He lived fully as a human being in trust in the Father God and in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Do we agree with that? Okay. As a result, if you're not reading the New Testament and the Gospel stories as a religious person, you will hear some amazing things. If you want to if you want to see the Gospels in a way you've never seen them before, if you've grown up like me in the church, have somebody who's never read them and never known about them read it to you. And they're going to be going, what in the world is going on here? Right? So, and we have friends like that. I mean, they will read it and they'll go, is this actually true? Well, I suppose so. I mean, we just, we put it in the category of stories and stuff. We don't even think about what's going on. Well, I'll give you a couple examples, and you get to watch Jesus. Pretty remarkable, actually. And the first one, he's like 30 years old. Hasn't gone to seminary or school, or he hasn't graduated from college. Basically still living at home, right? And he's got a little carpentry thing going of, of some sort or another, but he's, you know, he must not be that good at it because... He's not famous for it. He never tells any parables about it. I mean, think about it, right? He wasn't like, hey, there's a guy that makes perfect doors. Do you want a door? you got to go to Nazareth, because this guy makes like perfect doors. I mean, this is Jesus, a human being who learned how to do things. You know that he got his, some of his math problems wrong. Right? Making mistakes in the process of learning is not sin. It's human. Do you understand? We kind of, we've kind of said, well, he's human, but he's not really. Right? Like he, when he's a baby, he's going, oh, okay, I've got to remember I'm a baby. It's time to poop. You know? <laughs> he's a baby. He poops. And he, no crying he made. Are you kidding? <laughs> This is a human baby, right? He may be holding the entire universe together, but he is fully a human being. So he's 30 years old. His mom's kind of, you know, she goes in and out of... Because it shows up even during his ministry, right? Where his mom's going, oh... I wonder if that was real. You remember when he comes and she comes and says, come home, you're making an absolute fool of us, basically. Right? There's some of this going on. Well, he, they get invited to this wedding thing. And he's got some friends, guys, that are hanging out with him these days. And they get to this wedding and it ends up with a situation. And Mary looks at Jesus and says, do something. Right? Like, it was one of those moments where she's pulling from her history and going, I was there when these kings showed up and told me, and the angels, I remember that. But it was like 30 years ago. And I'm kind of like, you know things aren't so good in the country, and you're God who's in, you know, do something. What does he say to her? Woman? Woman. He doesn't say mom. Right? And the word, it's like woman. And he says, what do I have to do with this? My time has not yet come. All right. Now back off for a second. One of the things that was consistent about what Jesus 
continued to say about his relationship with the Father and the Spirit is this, I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. So when Jesus responds to Mary and says, Woman, what do I have to do with this? My time hasn't yet come. If he says that, guess who said that to him? The Father. See, this is Jesus who has never known isolation, independence, disassociation, separation. He constantly hears the Father. And he has always heard the Father from prior to the Incarnation and now in the Incarnation. And he has been full. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. He has been constantly in relationship to the Holy Spirit, right? This is the way he lives. And when he says, woman, my time has not yet come. That is exactly what the Father just said to him, because he said, I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. What does she do? Eh, whatever. Hey, guys, <laughs> do whatever he tells you to do. She is a Jewish mom, right? <laughs> Whatever. Hey, right? Now, the crazy thing about this story is that he then does it. Now, doesn't that surprise you a little bit? I'll give you another story, and then we'll come back and, and I'll fill in the gaps here. There's this situation where he's got a bunch of his, his brothers, I mean, biological brothers, pardon me, Catholics, but, but they're, they're like his for real brothers who are wanting Jesus to go to the big festival of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles, the party feast, right? And so his brothers are saying to him, Jesus, come on to the, tabernacle, uh, to the feast, come on to the feast. And Jesus says to them, and it makes a big deal about it, they constantly were after him to come to the party, and he was saying to them, no, I am not going. My time has not yet come. He says that to them. And he says to them, you go and enjoy yourself. I'm not going. Right? And if you read the story, they go, and then he goes. Is that not weird? I mean, I know that he doesn't lie and stuff, but he's, it looks like he did. So what's going on here? Wedding. Woman, my time hasn't yet come. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. She says, hey, and she then involves these servants because you know what? If, if God wanted to, he could have created the water to turn into wine. He didn't need to involve. But this is a God who loves participation. This is a God who has never done anything by himself. Right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have never done anything alone. Ever. Right? This is a relationship that is a constant. And now, Mary steps into this participation, involves these servants, and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And he does it. Why? Because somewhere between him saying, my time hasn't yet come, because that's what the Father says to him, and her saying, whatever he says to you to do it, what did the Father tell him? Now your time has come. And it took a matter of maybe five seconds when the Father said, your time has not yet come, that was the truth. And five seconds, ten seconds, whatever it took to say, whatever he tells you to do, do it. The Father said, now your time has come. This is living in the Spirit. This is where there is a constant dialogue and an interchange relationally about what's going on around me. When you pray, things change. Even if with your physical eyes, you can't see it. There are things. That's why you're not to pray in vain repetition, because things aren't the same. Start your prayer with, so what has changed? And now what do we pray for? What do you want me to participate with here in this conversation? 
Your participation changes things. But we're dealing with the complexity of human beings who are massively creative, powerful beings. You can't control people through prayer. That's not the point of it. It's not magic. It's part of a conversation that's about relationship. Same with the brothers. My time hasn't come. You go. Because that's what the Father says. Your time hasn't come. He wants them to go. Have a good time. As soon as they're gone, Father says, now your time's come. He goes, oh, great. I really wanted to go to the party. Good. So we're going to the party. Right? Because if otherwise, he lied to them. But that X's out what this relationship and this constant dialogue is going on. Sometimes that dialogue is so enthusiastic on the part of God, people hear it. This is my son. Remember that one time where out of heaven came, this is my son, right? And it says, and everybody's going, wow, did you hear that thunder? And he said it audibly, but see, God doesn't speak, so it must have been thunder. In this relationship, there is a constant interchange. There is a constant movement. There is a constant dialogue taking place. And you see it over and over and over. It also means that this relationship is at the center of choices that we make in terms of what's, what's, um, what's happening. Okay. One of the things that the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and a few of us when the shack started to go crazy. With regard to it, these words, walk, don't run. Walk, don't run. Now I thought I knew what that meant. And you know how when something gets spoken to your heart, sometimes it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to figure out the dimensions of it, the facets of it, the implications of it, right? And what seems to be a very simple thing at the beginning begins to unfold. And so over the next period of time, I'm thinking, walk, don't run, walk, don't run. What's that all about? Walk, walk, don't run. You know, and um, I was looking at scripture, trying to find, wait a second, is there anywhere where God runs? One place. Story of the prodigal son. That's the only story we have where God runs. And why and in what direction is he running? Toward us. And if you remember the story, he is getting to that boy before that boy completely falls to pieces. And what has that boy been doing? Rehearsing a confession. And does the father go, okay, come on, confess. He doesn't even let him. What does the father do? Communicate to his son the truth about their relationship. And the son didn't even remember that. The father puts the coat on him, gives him the ring, says, let's have a party. And you're going, what kind of an irresponsible God is this? Right? He's been rehearsing his confession. At least give him a chance to say it. You know, and he should. Do you understand how wild and crazy that story is? But that's the only story where you see God running. And I'm thinking, Jesus says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it, and he never runs anywhere. Can you think of him running anywhere? And if you think about it, he didn't run in certain situations where, because he was so slow, people died. Right? Remember, he hears about his best friend, Lazarus, right? And does he run there? No. And if you look at a map, it's like a quarter inch. <laughs> right? It should have taken him no time to run there. I mean, his friend is dying. Wouldn't you think that would be a good reason to run? And he doesn't. And he's so slow that Lazarus dies. And he has to, and what does he say? His disciples, he, they keep pestering him. What about, we need to get there. There is a need here. Doesn't that mean you're called to be there? No.
And Jesus walks, and he walks slow enough to encounter the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus, whose 12-year-old daughter has died, that we would have never known about, and they would have never been healed if he'd have run to Lazarus. A lot of times we have this sense of the affection of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We celebrate this, and then we get an idea for a ministry, <laughs> or a vision, or a prophecy, or a word, or something. And that now becomes the thing that can give us identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, and love. All the things that we were getting right here inside the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we will run to that thing. And we will be trying to open up the doors and wondering, why are they not just opening up? Wasn't it God who gave this prophecy? Wasn't it God who gave that word? Wasn't it God who gave that dream and that vision and that idea for a business or ministry or whatever? Wasn't it God? And we're going, where is God? And we look, and he is walking two miles back there with our children we ran past. And he's walking with our spouse that we ran past. And he's talking to the woman with the issue of blood. And he is talking to Jairus, whose 12 year old daughter has died. Jesus gets to Lazarus, but he walks in the relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And does his heart not break for his friend? Absolutely. It says that he has this gut wrenching fury. Compassion is grief and anger. This is wrong. Wrong to the core. And because he is in a relationship, he is expressing, expressing not only his own heart and his own desire to say, Stop! This is wrong. But it's the affection of the Father and the Spirit with him. And he is with them. And in the power of that relationship, raises his friend from the dead. He didn't outrun his relationship. This is where the activity, this, living inside the grace of just one day, this, in this encounter that is ongoing, is where we are designed to live. Jesus has never known a moment of his existence where he couldn't sense the presence of the Father and he couldn't hear his voice. But that moment is coming and he knows it. He knows why he's here. He learned it. And he knows it. And there's a timing to it. There were a couple times when people tried to kill him and he was able to walk through a crowd as if they didn't exist. You know the stories? They're in the Gospels. The Father cares about his Son and he does something incredibly special for him. Right before Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and he knows what he is walking into, he's very clear in his own mind about it. He goes up on this little hill and talks to two dead guys. This is not a parable. This is inside the history. He talks to two guys who've been dead for hundreds of years. Is that a little weird? Strange? Outside your box? Not very Western? <laughs> These guys are dead. And why are they coming to talk to him? I thought that they were gone and in heaven and all this stuff. They're coming to talk to him to encourage him about what he's facing in Jerusalem. They are fully aware 
This is the great cloud of witnesses. You think we're in this room by ourselves? You think we're at this point of history and we're isolated from the community? You think the, the saints are not praying for you? You haven't read the book of Revelation. You don't think that Jesus is interceding for you? That he is not aware of what you're dealing with? You think you're kind of don't matter and you're dealing with your own little bits and pieces? Those little bits and pieces affect the entire cosmos. And out of the kindness of the Father's heart, out through the veil that separates these two realities, steps two guys who've been dead to talk to Jesus and encourage him about what he's facing. He's a human being. He doesn't want to go to the place. And think about this. This is the I am who knows I am going to become the I am not. I am going to go down there into the I am not, into the belly of the beast, into the lies. And that surrounds the conversation in the upper room, John 13 through 17. I'm going to go prepare a place for you because in my father's house there are many dwelling places. And if I go to this cross, I will come again and receive you to myself. So that wherever I am, you may be also. And the work that I do, you will do also. Not the work that I did. I'm not going to stop doing my work. But now, I will be in you in a way that you understand it. And the work that I do, you will do also. You're not going to be sitting across the table watching me in my authority. I'm going to go spread the Holy Spirit, my spirit, the spirit of Jesus, through your lives, through all of you, and you will participate in the work that I'm doing. He goes to the garden, and he has a massively difficult evening. Let this cup pass from me. Is there another way? Is there another way? I don't want to lose the sense of your affection. He knows that he is going to be inside our darkness, inside the darkness of every one of these men he loves. And beyond them, the darkness of the entire human race. He's a human being. He gives himself over to this. Do you remember that that process was so powerful that when he even stated who he was, these temple guards were just knocked off, knocked backwards, right? It's a magnificent, painful, hard story. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> that is the most precious thing that I ever heard Jesus say in the Gospels. Do you know why? That's my cry. Most of my life, my cry was, where are you? I can't see you. I can't sense you. Where are you? And not only is it my cry, it is all of our cry. Do you know what a cross is designed to do? Do you know how it's designed to finally kill you? 
suffocation. What is suffocation? Where you cannot breathe anymore. What is your breath? Breath, spirit have always been linked all the way back to Genesis. And he breathed into this dirt and it became a living soul. A cross is designed to force your breath to leave you. Jesus, who enters my lostness, can no longer sense the presence of the Father, nor hear his voice, nor sense his affection. That is my lostness that he willingly entered. And in the middle of that lostness cries Psalm 22. But this is a man who knows the whole psalm. And he knows those verses that Baxter quoted. You don't despise the affliction of the afflicted, nor will you turn your face from him. And when he cries, you'll hear. And as the last statement of revolt against death, what does this man shout? Other than it is finished, which is the last verse of Psalm 22. He says, into your hands I give my spirit breath. The cross is designed to force it out of me. I give it to you. And he could have never made that declaration of trust if he thought for a second that this father would have abandoned him. I give you all I have left. And he dies. He gave his father everything he had. And he did it in my darkness, in my brokenness. This is the love that is relentless. This is a God who does not do abandonment. This is Paul the Apostle who says, For God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Where was he? Did God have to turn his back? This is God in the flesh who became sin and entered my darkness to embrace it and Declare his faith and trust in his Father's affection in the power of the Holy Spirit, which was his very breath. And when he died, I died. What do you think baptism is a celebration of? And when I rose, it's because he rose and I rose in him. But we esteemed him stricken by God. We turned our faces away from him. And in that anger, the Father encounters our sin, meets us in that. That is the God who loves us. And we didn't even vote or ask for it, right? We're saved by this grace. He won. And he won by submitting to us.
This is the relentless affection that pursues you. This is a God for whom you are the one that he left the 99 to go find. This is the God who sees you and runs to you. This is the God who is the woman who scours the house and lights the light to find the lost coin because it's precious to her. This is the shepherd who left the 99 and you're the one. You're the one. I'm the one to the praise of his glory. Amen? Amen. Good night.